now it's the, the lecture four of our course and I want to explain you a bit on how the database, on the background of the database and what databases we have and then we do some exercises on solubility and speciation and how to calculate saturation indices. Uh, there's also a general overview of hydrates in cements and there's a ch uh, chapter number five which is on details how to make the entries into GEMS. This will be mainly self-study. And if you have any question, do not hesitate to ask. On a very general level, we have two or three or more databases always present in GEMS. We use the PSI Nagra TDB as a general database and then on top of it we normally use the same data but there's also other databases which you can add to your system. The PSI Nagra is done at PSI, that's a research institute in Switzerland which specializes on, on thermodynamic modeling and rad waste and similar things. If we have a bit a closer look on the databases, we can see here the general database. And if we look on the same database, we have data for so-called AFM phases, that's aluminum iron monophases. We have data for AFT phases, that's aluminum iron three phases, like ettringite, we have hydrogarnet, we have CSH phases, and many of them make solid solution in between. We also have, we, we continue to work on the database and uh, every few years we add some additional data like we have just added now chloride, nitrate, nitrate, AFM data, relative humidity, MSH, we added zeolites and we continue to add more data on zeolites. So a database is never completely finished. It just finished to some extent. This is an overview a bit about the history of the databases. We already had the general database. There's the first cement database was published in 1985 in Babush by Babushkin et al. He's a Russian or he was a Russian scientist and actually he published a Russian version something like 10, 15 years earlier. That was before the time where we use computers, so he did all the calculation by hand. Then there was a very good database by Weirden and in 2007 we started to make the same, the first same database and we have made a major update two years ago. There's also one other famous cement database, it's the one by Blanc et al. He uses a bit different with a general database, he used the FreeXC database and so they are not fully compatible. But depending on what you look for, this is also a very good reference. And here we just have listed all the references for the database. You will find everything also in the paper, which is on the, on the cloud, on the same data database and you can see all the entries we have in there. We have log K, we have Gibbs free energy, we have enthalpy, we have entropy, and these are the coefficients of the heat capacity equation. And here we have the volume and the reference. We have in some data, we have two general databases. We have one with a focus on Portland cement and one with a focus on alkali activated cement. In the, and basically they are the same with exception of the CSH model we use and the hydrotoxide model we use. In Portland cement we want to have a CSH model where we can reach high calcium to silica ratio and thus we prefer to use the CSHQ model developed by Kulik and there we also take into account that there can be some alkali hydroxide to estimate the alkali uptake. We have a, sing, a, a very stable hydrotal site. If we go on alkali activated model, alkali activated materials, 
it's often we have a lot of aluminium so aluminium uptake becomes much more important and there we use a CSH model developed by Myers et al based on the CSHT model which has a lower calcium to silica ratio but is also able to model aluminium uptake. Uh, for hydrotalcite in alkali activated slugs, for instance, you have much more hydrotalcite, and we know they have a varying composition. So, to model that, there we have included different hydrotalcites, which are a bit less stable. Actually, hydrotalcite is one of the difficult phases because it's difficult to measure their solubility, and we are not completely sure at the moment what would, would be the best version to use. For you, important is to remember that you have to choose whether you want to calculate Portland cement or whether you want to calculate alkali activated cements, else you get a bit of a chaos if you select everything. There's also a number of other CSH models. If you don't want to use the CSHQ, there's a topomorite genite, there's a CSHT, and you can basically choose what you want to use. However, in the course, we will always use CSHQ. This is how your input should look like if you do Portland cements and yeah, this is just for you to, to, to look at it. This is a bit uh, summary what the change from same data 07, which we used in many of the papers to same data 18. It's mainly that the iron phases or the iron is now going all into this silicious hydrogarnet, which has an effect on the amount of AFM phases like monosulfate and, hemi and monocarbonate. And uh, that's basically the main, the main difference. And if we have a closer look on the distribution of iron, we can see in the old version of the database, we had iron in all AFM and uh, hydrogarnet phases, and now the iron is just in the silicious hydrogarnet which then indirectly naturally affects a bit the distribution of aluminium and of everything else. You can download anything on this homepage, empa slash semdata, and there's also a lot of tutorials to find there. A few words on the alkali activated materials. This, as mentioned, it's from a paper of Myers, and he fitted his data against a lot of measurements from alkali activated materials and this is a comparison of the model against experimental concentration so it's a, a fairly good fit but we still work on it we hope to make it better one day and if you want to calculate alkali activated materials that's how your database should look like when you set up a new project Is there any question or anything unclear? If not, then we will continue. There's also, or here we learn GEMS, but there's also a Freak C version for those who prefer to work on Freak C. As mentioned before, we get the same results, more or less. Not if you look on, on digit number 10, but uh, you, you, if in general you get the same results. The only thing you have to define the solid solution by yourself in, in Freaksy, because there it's not part of the database, but it's something you have to define in the input. Also, this one is available on the same data homepage and can be downloaded. This is just to convince you that it's really identical. Uh, the, the dashed are from GAMS and the dotted are from Freak C, and you can see you don't see any significant difference between the results. Now let's have a look on databases. Um, if you use the same data, you always have to use it together with the PSI Nagra TDB. 
or a derivative thereof. Why do I mention that? Because there's a number of different general databases available and they should be, so the specific database you use has to be consistent or agree with the general database because else you can, can get errors. We have different data formats. We can have log k. This is used as input in freak C. You can use it in GEMS. It's also used in Minecule and other um, softwares. Or you can use Gibbs free energy of formation, which is used as input in GEMS as well, or in softwares like MT data. The log k and the Gibbs free energy of formation is closely related. As you can get the log k from this equation here, from the Gibbs free energy of reaction, and the Gibbs free energy of reaction is the sum of all Gibbs free energy of formation, including the, the numerical factor on, on how many of each of your components you use. So basically, whether we use log k or Gibbs free energy of formation, it's a consistent information which can be calculated one from the other. Maybe a few words on the limits of thermodynamic modeling. Thermodynamic data are based on measurements and normally they are associated with a certain error. Even if you measure it several times, there always will be an error. And in some cases, small differences can at least thermodynamically, leads to the stabilization of one or the other phase. So that's also why we continue to work on the database, because we want to get more and more accurate. But be aware that it can be that you, you, due to the errors in the database, you might get a slightly wrong result. We also have gaps in the database. We still work on aluminium, potassium, sodium uptake in CSH. There's also a range of other elements which might be taken up in CSH, like sulfate, like many of the heavy metals, lead, zinc, whatever you can think of. There's the important questions of kinetics. Some phases are metastable. So for instance, CSH itself is metastable with respect to crystalline CSH phases like tobomorite, chenite, and others. The hydrated cement itself is also thermodynamically unstable if it would be exposed to the open atmosphere because there it would react with all the CO2 in the atmosphere and eventually degrade to calcite and similar solids. And we also know we have slow kinetics. For instance, the clinker phases, they do not dissolve immediately, but they dissolve step by step quite slowly. And then we have the formation kinetics, which also can be slow. As we already discussed several times, quartz will not form in your experiments. Also dolomite, goethite, hematite, gypsite, talc will normally not form in your experiments. So if you see that you calculate the phase like that, then think whether it really can form or whether you have to deactivate it in the calculation. Thermosite is a bit a special case because it only forms at low temperature or the kinetically it forms fast at low temperature and more slowly at higher temperature. So often we also have to deactivate that. So now we want to go back to GAPS. We already did work a lot on the calculation, but now we want to have a look on the composition of the database. And to look on the database, one basically can look here. That's the database button. And if we go there, we see a range of additional buttons. We see one which is called ICOMP, that's the chemical element, calcium, oxygen. We see dependent comp component and reaction of dependent components. Basically, GEMS gives us here the option to use either the Gibbs free energy, which we use then here, or the log K of reaction, which we can use here. It doesn't matter which input we use, 
it goes to the same box in the end. This is a special thing to calculate pressure and temperature dependence of the reaction or of the Gibbs free energy. This is a bottom which is called solid phase. The solid phase it, we need to define whether we have single solids or whether we have solid solutions. We come to that later. And the bottom you already have seen, which is called compost. There we can put in predefined composition, which we then can use as input. This is not associated with thermodynamic data, but there we can define things like Portland cement or fly ash or a solution we want to use or whatever. So let's have a look on each of this subse subsection or each of these different parameters. We start with independent component, which is the one here. You can see here on the example of calcium, it's the name, it's the chemical formula, it's the standard state, solid. It gives the mass, it gives the entropy and the heat capacity. It gives the volume, it gives the valence. Calcium is normally two plus, And I think that's more or less what is important. So for each chemical you want to use, you need a e comp basically the, the, the properties of the element itself. Then if we look on decomp, now we can see all the, the hydrates and aqueous species. So we can see, for instance, calcium hydroxide. We also can see calcium oxide, lime, or we can see calcium 2 plus down here. If we click on Portlandite, we get a thing like that. There we have a name. Here we have a second field which gives the chemical composition. This has to use a defined format. So we have to use the chemical abbreviation as we defined them into the ECOMP. And we have to use parentheses. And then GEMS normally calculates the molecular mass from it, which is given here. This is the charge and we have activity coefficient. We used it for aqueous species, but not for solids because the activity of a solid is always equal to one. Now let's have a look what the other thing is. This is the volume, gives free energy, enthalpy, entropy, heat capacity. Down here we have option for pressure and temperature and we also can give references. So this data set is from Warby and Hemingway and there's also a log, the Gibbs free energy comes from a log K, which relates to the, to the solubility of Portlandite. The everything, you also can see the units here. The one special thing is the units of the volume. It's in joule per bar which corresponds to 10 cubic centimeters per mole, which you might rather find in table. It's a thermodynamic convention that they use it like that. So here is an example of the reference. You can get the reference if you click on it and there's also often some, some remarks. If we go on decomp on the second page, we can see something that's called ACP temperature. This means this is the equation, the heat capacity equation as a function of temperature. Heat capacity is not the constant value, but it changes with temperature. These values you can find tabulated. You, if we go back to our same database, you can see you have entropy and then you see a number of additional values, A0, A1, A2, A3. And these are the parameters of this equation. And from this equation, one calculates a heat capacity. And maybe just as an example, this is the variation of heat capacity as a function of temperature as calculated for um, cathode or hydrogarnet, it's the same. 
and you can see you either just can tabulate the values at uh, 25 degrees Celsius or you can use the full equation which shows gives you a certain change with temperature. I think for the moment you don't have to care too much about it but if you want to calculate at higher or lower temperature it's important to to realize that GEMS takes care of all these changes with temperature for you. Please do not hesitate to ask if there's anything you want to know more. There's a third button which is called React DC and there we have instead of the Gibbs free energy of formation we have reaction, we have log k and I just show you here the example of S2 minus, that's a reduced sulfur species, it's an aqueous species. You can see here the equation. So basically, uh, you would form it from taking one HS minus, then this goes into H plus and S2 minus, and you have a reaction con a log, a log K of 10 to minus 19, or the log K is minus 19. The K itself is 10 to minus 19 or 1, 1 to 10 to minus 19. From that, it calculates from these constants, it calculates the Gibbs free energy of reaction. And then from that, it calculates the Gibbs free energy of formation, which is given here. And the enthalpy of reaction and the enthalpy of formation, the enthalpy of reaction, which is put here to zero, the enthalpy. Of formation so that's the same as in the decomp and the heat capacity and again you have pressure temperature mass charge and activity coefficient this is a way to make input if you only know or if you mainly know the reaction data and not the Gibbs free energy of formation but it's equivalent as said before And you all have that in the PDFs. Then we have one more here, which is called the phase. And this is a bit the speciality of GEMS. Every solid has also to be defined in phase. So basically, if we go back to our Portlandite example, we just have here an additional definition saying Portlandite here it states which database it refers to. And then this expression just says, the O says it's a solid phase. The D says we have defined it in decomp. And then this is just the name of the phase. So we have that for each one of our solids. But this is all included in the database. So you don't have to do anything. You just have to be aware that, it, that there you can look on all these entries. There's a last one, which is the predefined composition, the compass, where we already did an exercise together yesterday and today. And there, if you, for instance, have calcium hydroxide, it's also there as a compass. It's defined here again, and you can see here the chemical. And we can use that as input. We have one calcium, two hydrogen, two oxygen together. And this is the molecular weight we get out of that in kilo. So this is 74 grams per mole. And we can put, as we've seen, we also can define a Portland cement, a slag, a fly ash, or whatever we want to use as input. We don't need here for the compost, there's no thermodynamic data associated. It's just the chemical formulas. Good. Any question to the database? If not, then I want to have some exercises or we want to have a look, have a closer look on Portlandite and to see what's the effect of temperature and the effect of um, pH or first on the, on the solubility of Portlandite and then the effect of pH on the aqueous concentrations. 
we have seen this entrance before. It's the one for Portlandite I showed you. And we also have it all in our database. What we want to do is to make a new project. And I will now stop that. And uh, there was a question from Boran in GEMS, which data do we use for calculation? Or can, can we use this data? Basically, you always use the data you select when you make a new project. So each time you make a new project, you have the option to select which database you want to use. And this we will just now do together in GEMS. I open my GEMS page, if I manage. Oh, I open my screen, that's better. No, uh, stop, I have to go to the scams. I try again to share my screen with you. Yeah, okay. I, we did before calculation, so I go out so I can open a new project. Then I go back to the database mode and say, I want to make a new project. If I'm too fast, let me know, then I will be slower. I call it Portlandite, or CH, as you want. And I call it uh, Course 2020. Remember, there's a limited number of, of um, of uh, characters you can put in here. So I cannot write the Portland Night with the E because it just limits the number. Then I press OK. Then this time, as we only want to calculate the solubility of Portland Night, we don't need the same database. We just can stay with the PSI Naga TDB. So basically this time I decide I only use that. And this is just some subdivision and we generally use all of it. Then we press next, we did that before. Now I want to calculate uh, Portland light solubility. And I also know I want to vary pH. So I already select sodium and chloride. So I have the option to add the sodium hydroxide or HCl for acid-base titration. Then I press next. Then again, I select Helgesen. But this time we select NaCl, sodium chloride, because I just have sodium and chloride as electrolyte. So this sodium chloride corresponds to the first. So it's 0 0.046 for, for beta gamma. For the A0 value, it's also the first one. And here we put it to the last section. Then we press check and it changes to the Helgesen. Everybody there? Yes. Yes, good. Then let's continue. Then again, I can give a name. I call it Portlandite and I change the temperature to 20 degrees. I press OK. Then as input, I want to have some water. I want to have some calcium oxide. I want to have a tiny bit of oxygen. And I want to have sodium and HCl. I think I wanted to have one liter of water, one kilo, 10 grams of calcium oxide, 0.1 gram of oxygen a tiny little bit of sodium and a tiny little bit of HCl. Now here for the HCl and the NOH, I put the units to M. M means mole, not mole per liter, but mole. But as I have one liter, it means mole per liter. Why do I have to put mole here? It's basically 
because afterwards we do some titration and it's better for GEMS or it's easier for this titration unit to function if we have here molar units. You also could put millimoles, but I prefer to put moles for the moment. Everybody there? And then I can put the remark solubility of CH Portlandite if I want to. Press OK, press check, and then I calculate. <laughs> So one thing we can see, we get a pH of 12.65. It's what you expect for, Portland, for Portlandite. We get oxidizing condition. We get the ionic strength of 0 0.05, and this is all fine. If we look on the specific results, we also can see that we get a total calcium concentration of uh, 0.021 moles, so 21 millimoles per litre, which is also what we expect for saturated calcium solution. So that is all fine. Now I want you to show on how we can calculate the effect of temperature on the solubility of Portlandite. Now we just did 20 degrees and for now I want to calculate it from zero to 100 degrees. So how can we do that? We have to make a new one. So we press on the plus button, which means make a new one. Then it asks us to select our parent file, which is Portlandite, or whatever the name of your file is, you press OK. Then we can call it temperature. And this time we select a P. The P stands for pressure and temperature extrapolation. Everybody there? Yes, but press OK, and here we can see sequential temperature and pressure change at fixed composition, so that's fine. We are happy. Then here we can see no script is pre-selected, because basically we can do all the thing just by this little thing. So we already learned this ITC is the temperature, so in degrees Celsius, so I say I want to go from zero. 200 in steps of two and I also change the step size for the numbering for our systems to one because I like it better that way and the rest sorry. yes sorry to interrupt what's the meaning of the value i and u i and and u i and u i and b I and you. Uh, um, next what? to the the, the first one. Next, uh, next, next. This I one. I and you. I and you. Yeah, this one. Okay. <laughs> I, I noticed that we have to input some yes, numbers. Yes. Sometimes we do. Basically, this is or oh, there there are different input options or different. All this is always we have a, a start value, end value, step size. So we already, this, the ITM, we used to numbering our output files. This is volume, this is pressure, this is temperature. That's what we're going to use now. The INU is a parameter where we can make a linear list. A, lin a, a list with, where, or a table where we increase from one number to next on a fixed step size. So we can use it to make a list from one to 100, just by putting I and U, the first one to one, the last one to 200, and then a step size of one. We also have here uh, YPXY. This enables us to make a list in logarithmic units. 
So it just help us a bit to 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 make lists in games. But now we don't really need it. That's fine. Okay, we, we, we go on and we will see it again. There's many more processes. Then we press next. I don't put this time any, any um, programming in it because I just want to change the temperature. Then I want to select the output. So what do I want to select as output? I want to have on the X axis, I want to have the temperature. So we have to look for the temperature. Uh, I can see, now I have to, to search for the temperature. I didn't, I don't know where it is. Does anybody see a TC? No. Oh yeah, here, CTC. Okay, now I, when I press like that, it goes on the Y axis, but I want to have it on the X axis. What I can do, I can use my white, white mouse and then I can select it as to the abscissa. You see, now I have it as X axis. You need the right mouse click to do that. If you cannot do it, we also can do it afterwards when we can edit the things. Then I want to have the total concentration of calcium and I want to have the concentration of the species. The concentration of the species I can find at MY, which is a bit further down, I want to have the concentration of calcium hydro of calcium two plus, of calcium hydroxide, and of hydroxide. So this is the total concentration of calcium. This is my calcium two plus concentration, my calcium hydroxide concentration, and my hydroxide concentration. Everybody managed? Yes. Yes. Good. Then we press next. Then it already gives us 51 steps because we said we want to go from zero to 100 in steps of two. So it already knows it needs to be 51. Uh, we have one number of mods A. We have four for number of columns for the output and we just press next. We could save the generated record or we cannot save it. I prefer this time not to save it and then I press next and finish. I can press save up here if I want to. As soon as I press save, I can see it here. I also want to put a command, uh, comment here. So Portland died as a function of temperature. Manage to write it. Temperature. Good. That's my output, and then I go to the to the results page to see what's happening. Now I press calculate, and I just let it calculate. So what we can see now. We see here the temperature in Kelvin, uh, in, in degrees Celsius, because it's a CTC. We see calcium total, so maybe we can change the name. We can change it to total calcium, just to be clear. We have the concentration of calcium 2 plus, calcium hydroxide, and hydroxide itself. We can make a picture, and we can label our picture so this is total calcium. This one is calcium two plus. You see when I press on it, it gets in bold on the picture. This is the concentration of calcium hydroxide. And then this is the concentration of hydroxide itself. It's also varies depending 
on on the on the temperature. Question to that. Did everybody get that? I think we did all of that. And I also can, can look on what we intended to say. It should look something similar like that. And you also can see if you add this two up, then you get to the total concentration. Now, is everybody happy with that and did get it? Yes, I don't hear anything, so we can continue. Now, I also want to see how that compares with literature. This is a picture from uh, a paper of Dan Miron a few years back. And you can see, similar to what we did, he predicts a decrease of calcium, of Portlandite solubility with temperature. He does it at higher temperature than we did. And he also can see that at higher temperature, calcium hydroxide gets more important than calcium 2 plus. So I, I think we did a good job and, and we predicted the proper thing. There's another thing for you when you work with cements. Portlandite is is uh, quite special as it really decreases the solubility strongly with temperature, while many other solids actually increase with temperature. If we change the pressure, then we also change again the solubility of Portlandite and of other solids. And one of the group works, which I will explain later, will be about that. Oh, it's not groups work, it's individual works by now. Okay, then I want you to show a second option on what we can do. And this is to see the effect of, of pH. And now we switch again to, to GEMS itself and do a new process where we look on the effect of pH. So I go back to my process file and say again, I want to have a completely new one. And by pressing the plus here. So it asks me again, which parent file do I want to have? I say, okay, use the one I did before. Then it asks for the name, I call it pH because I want to calculate what happens if I vary the pH? We take the G as I should have. I continue. I go back to the 20. I change here to the one. And now we have all the text, which says, uh, allows the, add the addition of acid and then of a base. And it says select acid and base from the acid base list. So we first select the acid and then we select the base. And now it looks like, like it should look like. Then we press next. We do the same thing as before. We can select pH as uh, X values by using the right mouse as abscissa. Then we can select total calcium as Y, as well as the activity of uh, the concentration of calcium 2 plus and calcium hydroxide. Everybody with me? Yes. Good. Sorry for the cows before. Now we can see it says we have 33 points it will calculate as well as three output columns. Then we press next. 
next finish and now I'm much more happy. I can put here uh, Portlandite as a function of temperature. Okay, uh, I can press save and then it appears over there. Now we have to see this little command. Basically, it's something that is programmed in. And the first thing is, it's a if then sequence or else. So first it looks whether the calculated pH and the intended pH it compares the calculated pH with the intended pH in the first step. In the second steps, it either adds some NOH or some HCl, and then it writes the amount of NOH or HCl added into this column. And once it's done, it will stop. Now we don't want to calculate from four to 12 because Portlandite precipitates at around a pH of 12.6 of 6. So instead we want to calculate the pH range from 12.35 to 14. And this in step size. Does anybody know the step size we wanted to use? Okay. Uh, of 0.05. Okay, 0.05. So this is the start pH, the end pH, and the step size. So it will start at pH 12.35, and it will make try to the next one will be pH 12.4, and then 12.45, and so on. Then this field, we have to change from minus 0.3 to two. So what is this field meaning? This field, gives the brackets on how much acid or base it's allowed to add. If we have a too small value, it will say it can, I cannot solve it. If you give it uh, too big values, it might have a bit problems to find the proper value. Then this field is another field which defines the accuracy it tries to get. So it will maybe stop when it has 13.99 instead of 14. Good, it will make more sense in a minute, don't worry. If we look on the output, we have now as x pH, as y1 we have the logarithm of calcium, and I also want to have the logarithm of the calcium 2 plus and the hydroxide. I can tell that to GEMS that I want to have the logarithm by writing LG and open and close the parentheses at the proper position. LG stands for, log for uh, logarithms to the basis of 10. So it's a log 10. And if you forget any of the parentheses, you will get an error message afterwards. Then we can go to the results page or mainly to put the cursor somewhere else and I can press calculate. And I agree to show the graphics during the calculation. Now it says I don't have a result within the interval. So I go back to my control files and he complains. He said, I start with two, it's not good. So what I can do, I just put here a minus two and I put here a three and see whether it, whether it works. When I made the mistakes and press calculate, then it only does one calculation, the parent file to check first whether it works. So I have to press it twice. And now it works. Basically, it needed a little bit more than the minus 0.3. It needed minus 0.032 to work. 
So what did it do? We can look on the results page. We see now it has tried to get a good pH in 0 0.5, 0 0.05 steps. It gives us the total calcium concentration in logarithmic units, the calcium 2 plus concentration, the calcium hydroxide concentration. And we can look on the picture of it where we can see a decrease of total calcium at higher pH, mainly or basically due to the precipitation of Portlandite. The other thing we can see, we also get less and less calcium 2 plus when we increase the pH and instead we get calcium hydroxide. So this is a cool way to make uh, solubility plots against pH and you can do that for all kinds of things. And it also will be one of the exercises you can choose to do for the individual work. Who has questions or comments or problems? And the, the recipe you input just uh, the acid and alkali. Yes. But, uh, why will it output the calcium? Uh, so let's go back to GIMS. Tyler. Okay, if we go back to in the process file, we always have a controls where we define the input. And we have a sampling where we define the output. Here we define calcium. The other thing which we also have, this process file relates to a single file, to the parent file. And we can uh -uh. see it relates to this parent file, which is labeled up here, Portland IG. So we can go back to see this parent file. And in the parent file, we had as input water, calcium oxide, and um, HCl and NOH. Anything we don't mention in the process file will be kept constant in the, during the process. So it goes back to this, to this Portlandite parent file and then just adds HCl or NOH. We can look here on the first calculation. Again, looking on the input, we see we have the same amount of water and calcium, but now we have put 0 0.32 moles of HCl in the system to make the pH of 12.36. Um, oh, so when we are opening a new project based on the parent project we just yes. to input the 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 new uh new new component yes it's it's most efficient only to define in the process file the things you want to change naturally what we also could do and i can tell you it makes no difference i also could write here x a underscore Funny parenthesis open and close C R O equals to 10. This is what we had in input. I could do that and I would get the same results. I can show you, we just can go back to calculate it again. So I calculate, show the graphics and it just gives the same thing. So you have both option to do it. Okay, I understand. But, and, and normally I'm just too lazy to, to, to redefine the things here again. That's, that's the whole thing. Any other questions? Uh, also the, the parent project, uh, you input uh, and calcium oxide. Why not input uh, calcium high hydroxide? It's you. Sorry, I have to share my screen again. You're completely free 
to use the input you want. So, oh, oh naturally, okay. it, it, it's both are okay. The, oh. If we go back to, if we look on the input, I can, so it doesn't matter. If we look on the input, I put calcium oxide 10 grams, but I could as easily select calcium hydroxide 10 grams. You just will have slightly less calcium because we have a little bit of water in these grams, but else it makes no difference. If I put uh, calcium hydroxide, uh, yes. should I um, should <laughs> should I decrease the amount of um, aqueous? Mm, uh, normally, what you do when you do you you follow what you do experimentally as near as possible. So, imagine we made another experiment where you actually put not calcium oxide, but calcium hydroxide, 10 grams, then I just would put calcium hydroxide, 10 grams. Oh, oh, oh. I then understand. I would, then I would calculate, save, then we can go back to our process file. I take now this away because else we will have it twice, calcium oxide and calcium hydroxide, and then I just calculate it again. It will look very similar because I just put enough, more or less enough of calcium of portlandite. The only difference you see is here, because here we run a bit out of we don't have enough calcium, because calcium hydroxide is a bit more heavy, so we have a bit less calcium. Oh. We can we can solve that by adding 11 grams instead of 10 grams, or I add 12 grams. And then this will disappear, this problem. Oh, okay, no problem, thank you. Very welcome. Oh, now it should be gone, the problem, I hope. Yeah. Any other questions? I got one question, Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, the program is that on my computer, I don't know why it stopped working. Uh, it says it's still running and it lets me wait for some time, but I waited and waited like 10 minutes. <laughs> okay, no, 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 this shouldn't. It sometimes can be that it takes 30 seconds or a minute and then, the, 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 then you just let it do because it doesn't, but 10 minutes, I would shut it down and open shut it. And then restart and re-tap in. Yes. Okay. 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 I see. Thank you. You're very welcome. We also can uh, look at it afterwards, if if you. For, but for the moment, I just would uh, kill it and and reopen it. But it happens very rarely that it gets stuck. The other problem could be if you have a computer where you have very very low available memory, it might uh, makes problem. This I cannot solve then. And it's only this pH titration things where we need so much um, memory from the computer. All the other calculations are less problematic. So if it's just this pH thing, then maybe you don't do it for the moment. And if you need to do it, you try to get a, a more powerful computer. Or you try again. And if it happens again, then I think it's a problem of the computer. Fine. Any other question? Laptop. <laughs> okay, I see. Yeah. Okay, Any? okay, we can go on. Uh, hello, Professor. Hello. Uh, I have a question. Yes. What does the Y axis stand for? Concentration? Yes, I didn't I didn't label it. I should have if we go back to my screen or to GEMS. I was too lazy to label it. I should go to customers and say it cons. And now it's it's nice. Or I if I want to be more correct. I also can write cons in multiple letters. 
no in log in log mole and g mole i i it's again if you want to make nice pictures i would recommend to take the results you have here and to export it into excel or origin or whatever software you prefer you can make picture with games they are readable but they are fine for report you have to hand in during your studies or for a report to your boss but if you want to make a paper or something where you want to have nice graphics use a nice graphical software to, to make it nice. But it's still helpful to have these GEMS pictures here because you can see immediately what the program is doing. Good. Other questions? Um, the, uh, I have another question. Yes. The, the why there is not um, a calcium hydroxide, the concentration of calcium hydroxide, um, is it because we assume that the calcium hydroxide is a strong alkali? Uh, uh, okay, so I there is no, there is no hi calcium hydroxide in the solution. There is. It's the blue one. It's the calcium hydroxide. Or you mean the calcium two hydroxide? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, there's no calcium 2 hydroxide. The calcium 2 hydroxide is the solid which limits the total concentration. So, anything here we just look on the aqueous concentration. But in the solid, we always have calcium hydroxide. We can go to one of our calculations. Let's go to calculation 5, I would say. We go to the single system. I want to go to calculation five, where we have a pH of 12.6. And if we look on the results, we can see we have calcium hydroxide, we have Portlandite. And we can look on the detailed results. Detailed results tell us we have at pH 12.6, we have 32 millimoles of calcium. And we have uh, 9.6 gram of Portlandite or calcium hydroxide. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you, Good. Professor. Good. There's another thing if we are not sure, when I mean, I'm just here, if I'm not sure what Portlandite would be, naturally we all, we all know, but I can use my white, white mouse and then I can select show record. And then I go back to the record. Then I can see calcium hydroxide. So there are many things. Okay. Any other question? Um, hello, Professor. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Uh, I'm still confused on the um, uh, wait the max amount of acid and based the value, and how to choose a reasonable value. You, you mean why we've selected once the logarithm and in the first ex experiments we selected the linear? Was that your question? Um, or you want to share the screen? Okay. Okay, maybe I share the screen. Uh, oh, now you start. That's good. That's good. Okay. Uh, here. Um, oh, okay. This is just the maximum amount of acid and base. And basically, I did the example before, so I knew what to expect. N generally, it's a good thing to, to maybe to start at minus one to plus one. 
but as I did the experiment or the calculation before, I, I, I sort of knew what limits I would, I would need. If you get the limit too narrow, as we've seen before, you just get an error message. And maybe I go back to my games, then I can show you. It's not really a problem if we go to here. And now I put it to minus when I minus two, but when I started, I had something like that, if you remember. And here you always see the amount it's at. So I made it very narrow and I see what's happening. And it says there's no result in the specific interval. Change interval. It tells us what we have to do. So I go back to the interval. And I see my first calculation, it got stuck at 0.1, which is the value I have here. So I know it had a problem. So I just make them bigger. And I go back to the two because I know at high pH we get above one. So it's just a bit uh, a thing of and now as it got stuck, I still have to put the stop and then I calculate again. And I have to press two times as there was a problem before and then it works again. So it's a bit uh, uh, a thing of trial and error. But there's nothing wrong if you, do, if you do things wrong because the program will tell you that you might have to increase. And the other thing, I have selected a relatively high pH because I know that Portlandite only precipitates at pH 12.5 or 6. So if I'm much lower, then I dissolve a lot of calcium and a lot of, of alkalis or uh, HCl and, and I just get the total initial concentration back. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? If not, we do the last part of our presentation, which we already did all of that. And you will find all the details we discussed in the PDFs. Uh, there would be one part on colorimetry, and maybe we go through that very quickly. It's if you have a hydrating cement, you normally see a curve like that, where you have an initial period, an induction period, an acceleration period, a sulfate depletion peak, or a shoulder, which we call second aluminate reaction and the deceleration period. We can use the heats of hydration we have in our database or also in GEMS to remodel that if we know how much has reacted. And so one can make very simple things like saying if we have one mole of a light, some moles of water, and we reacted to, to CSH and Portlandite, we can calculate the total enthalpy of, of reaction, basically saying one more, that's the enthalpy of a light, that's 3.9 moles of water. Then we make a CSH plus some 1.3 Portlandite, and then we get a total enthalpy of reaction, or which we can, um, say in uh, kil kilojoule per mole or in joule per gram a light if you want to recalculate it. So that's the, the, the amount we would expect. We also can, sorry that was too fast, we also can if we just take the little amounts of a light reacting at each moment we can calculate that heat for each steps and if we put it over um, time, then we even can get the milliwatts per gram, the heat flow. This is described by paper of Janssen et al. And you see the, the red one is the calculated heat flow 
from a light reaction. We, and we also can see we miss here the shoulder, which we cannot explain, but the other thing is the major part of the first main peak is due to a light reaction. They also did very detailed XRD analysis and they've seen there's a, a very early C4A reaction and then there's a second reaction of C4A of aluminate at the moment when we see the shoulder and they have a more or less continuous ettringite formation. They used this data to recalculate also the heat associated with C3A dissolution and ettringite formation. And if they add everything up, basically you can see this heat explains this shoulder. So basically what is happening is we first have mainly the alite reaction and then at the moment when we have used up all calcium sulfate and sulfate concentration in solution is going down, then we have a renewed C3A reaction which leads to the formations mainly of some AFM phases at this moment, maybe monocarbonate or monosulfate depending on the composition. And you can use the heats either tabulated or with the help of GEMS to get this data. This is just a short thing how to calculate heat. We have all the enthalpies tabulated and the measured heat in a calorimetric experiment is due to enthalpy changes in the end. The very the most important thing to think about is not to forget about the water because a lot of the enthalpy we measure or the enthalpy changes we measure depends on the, on the, on the presence of free and bound water. I have put here a small example which you can calculate yourself in peace and quiet because we are a bit limited in time today. And now I want to go to the last point we really want to do an exercise together today is saturation indices. We have seen in our first lecture that we can gain pore solution out of the cement and when we have pore solution we also can gain information based on the measured composition. This is a typical pore solution of a hydrated Portland cement, high potassium, some sodium, some sodium much lower hydroxide at early times, high sulfur and high calcium, which then decreases after half a day when we get out of uh, calcium sulfate unreacted. So we can use this data to calculate saturation indices. And if we look on how this typically looks like in a, in a Portland cement, we can see if we plot saturation indices as a function of time, we are always positive for Portlandite, we are positive for gypsum during the first hours, then we get negative, meaning they are undersaturated. For ettringite, we are always oversaturated, and for monosulfate, we might be near the saturation. So how, what is the saturation indices and how can we calculate it? And why are they important? Basically, if we are oversaturated, it means a solid can form. If we are undersaturated, it means a solid will dissolve. However, just to be very, very correct, it doesn't mean it has to form if we are oversaturated. It just means it can form. And if we are undersaturated, it can be that due to kinetic reason, it does not dissolve. But if that's not a problem, it will dissolve. How do we calculate it? I made it here for Portlandite because that's a simple uh, solid. Basically, we, the saturation indices as we define it here, it's defined as the logarithm of the so-called ion activity product compared to the solubility product. We know the solubility product is a theoretical solubility which we have tabulated in, in the same data or somewhere else. And the ion activity product 
is basically refers to the measured concentration. However, we have a little problem. We measure total calcium, for instance, if we use an IC or an ICP, and then we need GEMS to calculate the calcium 2 plus activity to correspond to, to the same formalism as the solubility product. And I want you to show how to do that because it's also one of the exercises which, which will go on this um, saturation indices. So this is a list of data I have measured. And I, for the moment, we just concentrate on the first data set and we want to calculate the saturation indices. So I stop here and start to open GEMS and then we can do it together. I have to share my screen. We open GEMS. I close GEMS and open a new project. New project, I call it saturation indices. Call it course. I press OK. Now I want to call to select the same database as well. So I do the little exercise and select the faces I should select. Then I press next. I want to have sodium, potassium, calcium, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, and now I have to check that I haven't forgotten anything. Uh, I think that was everything I wanted to have. Then I press next. I go now to select the CAOH because CAOH is my dominant ion. And so I select the proper parameters, always the last one when it's for courage. Change this to and press check. Oh, I also have to do that before it makes sense. Everybody with me? Yes. Yes, good. And I say OK, then I call it SE and I go for 20 degrees. SE for saturation in it says. Press OK. And then it asks me for an input. I select 1000 grams of water because that's one liter of water, which makes my life easy. I put 0.1 gram of oxygen. And then I have to think about my how to input my measured data. What we normally do, I just use uncharged hydroxide complexes to make the input. So I use aluminium hydroxide and in the file we have said it's 0.094 uh, millimoles. So I put the H. If you want to know what the H is, you can go to help. There we see a context menu. We can go to XR. We can see con uh, concentration codes. And there you will see the H, which we can find somewhere. Now I don't see it. The H here, it is. I don't know why I didn't see it, which means millimoles. And that was the unit we had. So we put aluminium as millimoles. Then the second thing I have is calcium. I use calcium oxide again as H. And in the table, we have put 20 millimoles of calcium oxide. We have courage. This I didn't want to do. Courage, we had. Uh, 395 millimoles. Please correct me if I do anything wrong. NRH we had 76 again millimoles. So I used the 
H, then we had SO3, SO3 we had 168 millimole and silicon we had 0.11, again millimole. The important thing is you have to check that you have all units in H in millimoles because if you have grams then you will get this, a different result. Everybody ready? Yes. Good. Then press OK. Then press check. Then press calculate. So I've, you will see now we precipitated something. And naturally, if we have aqueous measured aqueous concentration, we shouldn't precipitate anything. So I have to tell GEMS to prevent precipitation. I can easily do it here or I can do it on two options but here it's easier. I can go here and then I go to the second page which is called decomp and I go down using the, the, the thing here. Then you will see here a title DLL and DUL. In GEMS or it does it for you it always defines a lower limit and the upper limit of any concentration. Normally the no, lower limit is zero and the upper li limit is one million moles, which is huge. And this is all aqueous, we don't care, but what we can do now, we can select all the solids. I just uh, select the first one and then hold down the, the function lock or the caps lock button and then I move down until the end. Then I use my right hand mouse to select the calculator and I put in a zero. Did you manage? It's a bit difficult the first time. The other thing is you just type in into each of this one a zero. So what did I do? Basically what I did, I said for any solid, the upper limit is zero. So it means it's not allowed to precipitate. Then I can press check and I can change to this view. And if I now calculate, you will see all these amounts of solid, they will disappear. Now, now no solids left. Did everybody get there? Yes. Yes. Okay. What can we learn now from it? We have here a column called log of SE, saturation indices. And as we have prohibited, we can see most of them are still negative, but some are positive. Do you remember? Positive means saturated. So if we look on the data, we can see we are saturated with respect to CSH, to ettringite, then we are negative, negative. We are saturated for the monosulfates and we are also saturated with respect to on, uh, Portlandite and gypsum. Or we can get the same kind of results if we go up here, which I if we go on this results page, we can also see the saturation in it as here. Here they are called FA, but it's the same value. So this is the saturation of CSH, saturation of ettringite, the saturation of Portlandite, and so on, of, mono, of monosulfate. So why do we care about that? Now, if we go back to, to our example, oh, here I use J, it's the same whether I use J for millimole per liter or whether I use H in millimoles, it gives the same results because I use one liter of water. Uh, why do we care about that? Because when we, sorry, this was a bit, 
basically it can, if we do this kind of calculation, it, we, we did this early time calculation now, then we can see whether our solution is saturated with respect to portlandite or gypsum because we still have calcium sulfate present or ettringite or monosulfate. And only when it's oversaturated, it might can form. Fine, a bit confusing. Good, then I want to share one last time my screen. So basically that's the kind of information. And maybe for Portland cement, we think we know anyway what's happening. But if you go for calcium sulfur aluminate cement or uh, another cement which is less well investigated, this can help a lot if you see the saturation in it. It also can help if you are interested in kinetics because the more oversaturated, the faster normally the precipitation is. And the more undersaturated, the faster the dissolution is. So if you want to study, for instance, the, the occurrence very early during the hydration of cements, then it's also important to know that. Now let's have a short look on what else is there or which we don't show today. There's a summary of the different hydrates in cement. If needed, we can look at it tomorrow. And it's also details on how to manage thermodynamic data in GEMS. Let's go shortly to there. Sorry, that was a very fast. Uh, here we would show you step by step for any of this, for instance, for decomp, how to create a new entry or uh, e-comp or whatever. So if you ever want to do something like that, and it's part of some of the exercises, you can look up, look, you can look it up there. However, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's preferable if, if you, if you read it by yourself and then come back if there's any problem.